Good evening, let's begin 320, 320, ring the bells. Let's all stand, shall we?
take your fire, but pray for John as he makes arrangements for his mom tomorrow, and we'll try to let everybody know as soon as we can what's going on. John's mom, if you don't know, Rosamond went to heaven, and by the way, there is a heaven. Amen. Don't listen to the world. Read the Bible. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus ever lied to you? Anybody else ever lied to you? Yeah. Not Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. In my father's house. Aren't you glad it's called a house? Mm -hmm. Just something about home. When we get to heaven, we'll be home. Yeah. We'll be home. The older I get, maybe it's a disease you get as you get older. But I'm hating this world the older I get. Yeah. I mean, I hate it, but I, I'm hating it more. They're, they're sick. I don't even read the news. The news comes at me and makes me read it. See these people taking pictures in the Senate chambers? The homosexuals? If we went in there and had a prayer meeting, they'd have a fit. We live in a sick world. Hey, in my father's house, house there are many mansions. We will, do you realize how great it will be to be home? Right? Father, thank you. As we just sang, Jesus came for us. He didn't just come. He came for us. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We rejoice in that. And Lord, we do pray. We ask you to give John wisdom as he prepares a celebration for his mom. We ask you to be in every detail that the right people will hear it and be there, and that you'll get all the glory. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you that we can be here. Thank you that we have something to tell. When we leave here, we're not done. We have something to tell. Use us, Lord. I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Page 307, Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. Page 307. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine.
shouldn't say hey, but hey. I hope they have a choir in heaven. There will. Yeah. We'll be there. I won't be in it, but I hope. Hey. <coughs> hey. If you have a bulletin, would you please note a couple of things this week? Awana on Wednesday. Of course, teens and adults. Friday is the teen Christmas party. The 24th. That, I, how many have your Christmas shopping all done? You're all done. Raise them high. Hold them up. Shame on you. Watch this. How many of you have not started? God bless you. You'll be the first to go to heaven. The biggest mansions are for you. How many of you aren't going to shop? Bah humbug. How many of you don't believe in Christmas? I believe in Christ. Amen. I don't like all the rigmarole. So next week, how can it be Christmas Eve next week? Help me with this. Say it, you're old. Help, I, like, bam, it's here. Five o'clock in the morning, everything's the same. But at night, we're doing an hour earlier. Same on New Year's Eve. Two weeks left of this year. I'm still writing 1994. <laughs> so I'm thinking 2024. I mean, people are like, oh, next year, January. I'm like, two weeks. Two weeks. So the ladies' seminar, and there is a sign-up sheet. If you would like to donate food for Awana, see that. Ushers are coming. Glad you're here. People from, Mark, do you live in Tennessee? Amen. Kentucky. Got to say it right. Kentucky. Right? Kentucky. The, if you are interested, Dr. Clarence Sexton, his service is on Wednesday night in um, that's going to be a big gap to fill if you're familiar with him or all he's done. So pray for the Sexton family. Pray for the Kaufman family. <coughs> they go through that. And won't it be fun to get to heaven? How many of you have somebody in heaven? Um, Becky? I think your dad's going to hug me first before he hugs you. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> he told me that before he passed. He said, tell Becky. I like you best. <laughs> you think God has favorites? Yeah, he does. We're all his favorites. I know you think I am, and I, I understand. <laughs> but God loves us all. Isn't that great? Ready to pray? You okay, Matt? I heard you were just skipping. Okay. I need to tell the truth sign. Some of you are struggling with that, so I need to <laughs> tell the truth sign. Can you hear the orchestra? I mean, it's wonderful. We ought to have you all up here and set. Because it's got to be better. It's got to be better up here. Hey? Hey? Hello? Anybody home? A? A? It's A. That's the Canadian. Hey or A? Ready? Ready? Tell me when you're ready. How many of you got something you're praying about? You really, not, I, I don't mean you're praying for your neighbor's cat to get well. I mean, there's something you're really, God needs to answer this prayer. You got one of those? You got one of those? Father, you just saw those hands. You know our hearts especially. So, God, I, I join in. I hope it's the right thing, but I, I just want to see you answer prayer. You do. Thank you, God. You do. Thank you that you answer our prayers. And Thank you that we can pray. Thank you that when we don't know what else to do, we just go to you and you can take care of it because you have. And you don't always, and you, you know best. But, Lord, tonight we just need you to work in our hearts and help us to rejoice. We just need to rejoice more, Lord. I pray 
In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, choir. Please take your hymnals once again. 311, 311 Silent Night. Let's all stand, shall we? seated. Kevin and Era are going to play a duet. John said it was beautiful. It, yeah. No, it was. Very nice. Very nice. Done, done well. How many of you grew up, and I don't know where this is coming from, so just forgive me. How many of you grew up in the area of Sonny and Cher? How about Simon and Garfunkel? How about Kevin and Era? I don't know how your mind thinks, but mine does not think right. Pray for me. That, that, look in my era, and I'm going to miss some. Sonny and Cher, Simon and Garfunkel, Hall and Oates, Seals and Croft. Those were all, and I wish I could forget those. But I'll never forget Kevin and Era. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 3, and Philippians chapter 4. I don't know how you want to turn to all those, but we're going to be in every chapter. Say, oh no, can't we get out of here? We're going to. But we want to take a little bit from each chapter. 
Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians, just turn to the book of Philippians. You say, that'd be easier if you just say that. That's no fun. Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter, don't turn to chap Philippians chapter 5. Let's read and then you'll figure out what we're going to talk about. How's that sound? <coughs> chapter 1. Chapter 1. You're going to have to work a little bit. I'm sorry. I don't, don't get mad at me. Or don't get madder at me. Don't get more mad. Matter. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. We're going to go kind of slow. I want you to see it. I want to soak in. I'm not just trying to read scripture, you know, right? You know that in about get the script, get read, it, then preach, and man, the I don't know what happens to you when you read the Bible, but the Bible is very convicting. It's supposed to be, right? I mean, I can rant and rave and make faces, and man, it the Bible convicts. I don't. Chapter 1, verse 4. Paul's in jail. He don't want to be there. He didn't ask to be there. Paul's in jail because he was obedient to the Lord. He didn't commit a crime. Government thought he committed a crime. The religious leaders thought he committed a crime. You know, God always knows where we need to be, even if it's jail. Paul needed to be in jail. God wanted Paul in jail. Say why? Ask God. He died in jail. You and I are not going to be rewarded according to where we were. People ask me all the time, are you a pastor? Where at? Lakeville. Lakeville? You know, I really don't care if people don't know where Lakeville is because I'm not here for them. Nobody told me to come here. God told me to come here. So I need to be here. And if he tells me to go to jail, guess what? I'm going to jail. I, I'm trying to go where he wants me. Now, note what's going to happen here as we read. What Paul's about to say 16 times. is that what Paul had the most did not depend on what happened to him. Paul's life was not wrapped up in where he was. Boy, our lives are. Huh? Gonna snow! Man, you're in northern Indiana. Wake up! Yeah, it's going to snow, right? We have been, I don't believe in luck, but we have been lucky. We've had good weather, good temperatures, no snow hardly. And they're saying, we're going to get snow tomorrow. It's going to be 40s the rest of the week. It's global warming. Say, what if we get a bunch of snow? I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I just don't want, and I talk, I don't want my disposition to depend on my position. So just remember, as Paul's writing, he's not saying something that is impossible. He's writing at us. Now, 
not to us. He's writing to the church of Philippi. But the, the church of Philippi has a message that's at us. Not to us, at us. So he writes verse 4, always. Don't you hate people that exaggerate? Huh? You know somebody like that? Every Christmas, you know what I do? Do you really mean that? You're going to say every Christmas? I don't think Paul would exaggerate because God would not let him get away with it. But he writes in verse 4 of chapter 1, always. You say, I've already finished the verse. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. We're not racing. We're trying to get something. Always, in every prayer, really? Every prayer? Paul, Paul, are you delirious? Every prayer. How many of you believe Paul prayed? How many of you would ask Paul if he was around? How many of you would ask him to pray for you? He's not, he's not exaggerating. He's in jail. He'd rather be visiting the churches. He'd rather be preaching. He'd rather be starting more churches. But he writes to this church, he says always, in every prayer of mine, for you, for you all, Making request. You there? Are you there? With joy. Makes me mad. Makes me mad. Because I'm not in jail and I struggle with joy. And Paul, Paul has the audacity to say, here I am thinking about you, praying for you. With joy. With what? Joy. Chapter 1. Verse 18. I love, and you ought to read the Bible. I was, when I was in college, Dr. Weeks, one of the things that he made us do when I, uh, I had several classes with him, but homiletics, he was, the, he was the preacher teacher. He taught us how to preach, and no, I did not listen, and yes, I flunked that class, but he said, when you read the scripture, make sure you read the scriptures with expression." Notice how Paul expresses himself. Verse 18, what then? Not just what then? What then? What then? That's boring, isn't it? I don't think, I don't think the Bible's a boring book, and I don't think it's meant to be read monotone or mononucleosis or whatever mono you want. But he writes, what then? In other words, I've just told you something, verse 4, he just talked about praying for them always, every prayer, when he prayed, always, with joy. But he's gone through some things, he's, he's talked about being in jail, verse 13, my bonds, he talked about those who are preaching or taking advantage of the fact, you know, Paul was like this, you never read of anybody standing up to Peter besides the Lord Jesus except Paul. Paul was an in-your-face kind of guy. So they knew if he's locked up, they could kind of capitalize on that because he would come after them and tell them what for. And he knew the scriptures. He'd give them scripture. He'd set them, set them in line, you know, line them up. And so he, he said... Uh, uh, you know, some are preaching, they're not preaching right, they're not preaching with the right motive, and so he gets to verse 18, and he says, what then? What then? He said, notwithstanding every way, 
How many ways? Every way. Did Paul have an exaggeration disorder? No, he, he means it. He says every way. Whether it's pretense, that means that you don't mean it. Pretend. He said whether in pretense, this is great, or in truth, Christ is preached. Don't carry this too far. If a donkey got up here tonight, did you hear me? Don't carry this too far. If a donkey got up here tonight and said exactly what I'm saying, it's still God's word. Paul is saying, these guys who don't mean it, he said, Christ is being preached, but it doesn't matter if they mean it or not, because Christ is that good and great. Look at that verse. Every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. He said, I therein do rejoice. Yea, and will rejoice. Now listen, already, already he's given us the key to being the right kind of Christian. The kind that looks like they're happy. The kind that looks like life is worth living. The kind that says, it's all about Christ. Not about me, not about where I am, not about what happens to me, not about what people think, not about what people are saying about me. Notice in that verse, he says, look at this. He said, I therein do rejoice. And it almost sounds like he's making himself rejoice. But he's not making himself rejoice. He knows that his rejoicing is not in how he feels. It's not in what he thinks. It's not what people say. He's saying, my, my joy, my rejoicing is in Christ. And then he adds, yea, that's kind of like in the Greek it means hey. You understand? He's saying, yea, like, yes. Like if your mother says to you, you love your mother, yes. That means you're supposed to say yes. That means how could you do anything else? Right? She birthed you. She birthed you. She changed you. She fed you. He says, yea, and will. You know, we would be happy if we'd plan on it. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I'm planning on rejoicing. Some of us are waiting for the sky to fall, so we're not thrilled about rejoicing. Oh, pastor, do you know how bad it's getting? I've read this whole book. And I know that I win no matter what they do. Let not your heart be troubled. Chapter 1, one more verse. Say, so you've got three more chapters to go. You are the smartest congregation I know. Chapter 1, verse 25. He just told us to live as Christ, to die. Huh? Huh? Hello? To die is gain. Hey, remember that? Man, he's saying, I want to go to heaven. He told us in verse 20 that Christ, Christ would be magnified. 
Why is he in jail? If he's out of jail, it's still Christ. You know what? I, nobody will say this. I'll say it. Maybe Paul wouldn't have been a good Christian if he wasn't in jail. Hello? You know, some of us wonder why we go through what we go through, where we're at, what have. Maybe that's the only way God knows we'll be a good Christian. Because all God cares about is that you and I are good Christians. So notice as we're reading, we're only trying, notice that all this hinges around the fact that Paul is saying, you know, my joy is not about where I am or where I wish I was or, hey, I'm getting out. When Paul writes, he never expects to get out. He knows that he's there because God wants him there. And so he says in verse 25, and having this confidence. He sounds like a real nutcase. How do you have confidence in jail? You know why he had confidence? Because that's where God wanted him. You know why you and I can have confidence? Because we know we're where God wants us. Now listen to me. Don't take this wrong. Sometimes I hate Lakeville. Hate. I don't hate Lakeville. Sometimes I just hate my location. We got to blame something. I mean, I'm not going to go, you know, I really hate life because I hate me. We don't say that. We blame something or somewhere. And so Paul is saying, jail isn't really jail if you're in the will of God. And so he, he makes this, this comment, verse 25, having this confidence, he said, I know. You know when you'd be real unsteady? No. No. You know when you are real unsteady? When you're going through a rough time. Now Paul, he says, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance. You there? And joy of faith. Are you seeing that joy is not in Paul? It isn't what it was. It isn't what he got. It wasn't in the special care package that he got from a church and money, and, and cookies, and, and a shaving kit, and, well, they probably didn't shave it. And he didn't, he didn't, you know, say, boy, I can't wait. You know, I, I get to uh, uh, get out. I get to go play basketball. I, I get to go to the, the prison gym. I get to go to the prison lie. It, it, no, no, he said, my joy is based upon my faith. So that means you can have joy anywhere. Because faith will always be there. Ready for chapter 2? Chapter 2, verse 2. He said, fulfill ye my joy. He didn't say, bring me joy. Fulfill, when he says, fulfill you my joy, he's saying, you know what, let me hear, do what you can to make my joy even better. Well, let me ask you a question. You don't just say, I'd like to have joy, because you don't know at what point that really is. So you say, hey, I'll take more joy. Hey, want more joy? Sure. Kind of like coffee. You want more coffee? I don't want coffee. No, it, top it off. Break, hot. Yeah. So Paul is not saying, no, I'm good. Hey, you all are good. Good enough. You joy? Yeah, okay, right, I'm, I'm good. No, he says, verse 2, chapter 2, Fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Notice how he links joy with the brain. 
what we decide. Hey, we talked this morning about obedience based upon what we decide. I'm going to obey because that's what I decide. Joseph said, I'm not going through with this thing. She's pregnant. She tells me it's God. I'm not going through that. The angel said, hold on, man. Just listen. This is everything God's worked for, and you're a part of it. Don't miss this, Joseph. Isaiah said this hundreds of years, and now here you are in the middle of it. You're going to walk away from it? That would be dumb. That's in the Hebrew. You won't get that because only us Hebrew scholars know that. The angel said, man, that would be dumb. And I know the New Testament's in Greek, I know, but, but the Hebrew, I was hoping it would throw you off. Joseph made the decision to go through with what God wanted him to go through because he chose to go through it. He was going to back out. He was going to run away. He was going to put her away privily. And he thought, and the angel said, this is what everyone's living for. And the Bible says Joseph was a just man. So you and I know that his mom and dad and his grandpa and all those people told him, you know, God, we don't know when, but God has promised a Savior. It's possible for us to miss God's blessing because we want to quit and walk away. And you'll see, as you, if you haven't, that's what Paul's saying. He didn't want to walk away from being blessed. And if it meant he had to be in jail to be blessed, then so be it. Chapter, same chapter, chapter 2, verse 16. Holding forth. Don't miss the word holding. Something you grab. Something you can touch. Something you hang on to. Holding forth the word of life. He said that I may rejoice in the day of what? Christ. Not in my day. The day of Christ. It's all about Christ. He said that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So again in that verse, he's talking about the choice, the decision to rejoice. Happiness depends on happenings. Joy depends on Jesus. Did he come? Is he still living? Is he coming back? Does he love you? Are you going to be in heaven forever with him? Then, then you can rejoice. Yeah, but I didn't get that raise. Will you stop that? Yeah, but things are tough, preacher. Did, but here, let me help you. Did Jesus come? Did he come for you? Are you a sinner? Is he coming back for you? If you die, will you be with him? Quit whining. Hey, you walk in my office. When you walk out, there's a sign as you walk out. It says, thou shalt not whine. W-H. W-H. And W-I. You shouldn't do that one either. Verse 17, chapter 2. Verse 17. Again, I love his expressions. He doesn't just write it. it. It's God allowed them to be them. And he says, verse seven, yay, or yes. And if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy. We don't talk like that, do we? I joy. I joy. But he said, what he's saying, I joy, I choose to joy. Not you caused it, I caused it. You understand in the reading of that verse? He doesn't say it happened, you didn't cause it. He said, I, I joy and, you there? Yeah, that verse, and rejoice. And rejo verse 17, and rejoice with you all. 
Now he's saying, what you do, I'm going to rejoice. I'm here. I hate it. Christ is bigger. Christ is greater. He knows what's going on. I trust him. He could come back. When he wrote to the Thessalonians, he didn't write like, this is going to happen someday. When he wrote about the rapture in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, he said, we which are alive and remain. You know what that's called? Confidence. He didn't live to get out of jail. He lived to see Jesus. He didn't live thinking, what a bummer. Man, this is all, what a bummer. When they had speculation about the, the, the rapture of the church, Paul wrote to them at Thessalonica and he said, I'm, I'm expecting to be ruptured. I know it's rapture, but some of you aren't listening. But you hear that. It's funny how you hear every mistake, but you don't hear a bunch of stuff you should. Verse 18, chapter 2. He said, for the same cause, for the same cause also do ye joy. That's weird. That's weird sentence construction. He said, the same cause. In other words, if I can do that, you can do that. He said, do ye joy and rejoice with me. You chose to come to church tonight. Well, some of you may not have. A lot of choices all day. You've made a lot of choices. Because that's what you wanted. One more, chapter 2, one more verse. Verse 28. He's talking about, I'm going to sound smart when I say this, and I probably am, Epaphroditus. He's telling them that he felt that he should send this fella, Epaphroditus. And he said God raised him up. He got sick and God, God healed him. He said, I, I don't know why he got sick. I mean, he came to help you guys and then he gets sick. Boy, things don't always go like we plan them to, do they? He said, verse 28, I send him, therefore, the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice. Now, now, wait, watch now. Not rejoice that you see him. Rejoice that you see him. Was he sick? Who made him well? It's all about Christ. Not about a baby in a manger, about Christ. He was Christ before Christmas. He'll be Christ after Christmas. The world sees his baby in a manger. You know, it's funny. Everybody's touchy. Be careful with Jesus. That's not him. He's not a baby. I mean, he wasn't a baby when he was a baby. And I think that's what was really, that, wouldn't that be hard? I mean, if you're Mary and you're holding Jesus and you really have your theology straight, how do you hold, uh, some of us, you remember when you had your kids? Isn't it great that your kids, when you hold their kids, think that you're a clumsy oaf that never held a kid before? Careful of their neck. Like, go do something. Like, we've never done that, so you're going to hand them to me, and I'm going to go, wow. You know how we, we're, hey, special treasure. Can you imagine being married, holding, holding, 
God. Here's how I would do it. Man, I'd get him as close as I could get without smothering him. Right? Because it's hard for babies to say, loosen up. But if I really had my theology correct, I would be thinking this, this. This is, is God. Chapter 3, verse 1. Notice his choice of words to begin this chapter finally. In other words, listen up. This is important. Not just I'm done. See, that's what you guys hear. Some of you live for those words. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You live for those words. I know you. Because when I say I'm almost done, you don't buy that. But when I say every head bowed, every, you go, yes. But when I say two more minutes, you say he means ten. Right? So when he... When he says, finally. Kind of like, pay attention. He said, my brethren. See it? You there? Rejoice in the Lord. Kind of saying, this is what I get. This is what I see. This is what I've learned. I'm taking you here. I, I, I know this, not just do it. He's saying, no, I do it. I know this. This is what will work for you, works for me. Finally, rejoice in the Lord. He said to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Verse 3. He said, we are the circumcision, for we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Chapter 4. See how quick, see how we kind of moved quick? Because we got to get going. I'm, I'm just still reading the scriptures. I haven't hit my introduction yet. Chapter 4, verse 1. This is how I know Paul is a Baptist. Because in chapter 3, he said, finally. Chapter 4, he says, therefore. I mean, you and I think he should have been done in chapter 3. He's a Baptist, ladies and gentlemen. You don't just quit and stop. He says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy. Were they with him? No. Did he know them? Not all of them. Were some of them trouble? Probably. If they're Baptist, they were trouble. So you and I know he's, he's choosing. He's deciding that if Christ loves them, he's going to love them. Have you ever prayed Watch. You ever prayed for someone that God would change them? That God would do something to them because things weren't right? You just prayed. God changed them. Did he? You ever had one of those? Amen. It's kind of like where Paul's going. You know, butter him up, my dearly beloved, long for my joy. In other words, you are, but I want you to be. He said, and crown so steadfast the Lord my dearly beloved. And then the most famous verse in this book, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice, verse 10. He said, but I 
rejoice in the Lord greatly. That now at the last your care of me have flourished again wherein you are also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Would you pray with me? Father, I, I want this to speak to me. I don't want to just speak it and uh, have this goal that everybody will change and be happy so it'll make it easier for me to be happy and uh, may all of us see that this ought to be a teachable moment. This ought to be a moment where none of us say, no, I'm happy. I'm happy enough. No, no, I rejoice in the Lord. Father, I pray we will be honest. That shouldn't be hard. Sometimes it is. I pray that we will see our need. See our true condition. See our failure, our, our lack. And God, that we would just say, I, I am choosing joy. I, I'm, I'm, I, because I can, I'm going to rejoice. No matter where I am, no matter what happens, no matter what I get or don't get, I'm going to rejoice. Either Christ is enough for me to rejoice or he isn't. And if he isn't, I ought to walk away and stay away. But if he is, if he is, and he is, may it so infect me tonight. Lord, I, I just want to be affected and infected by you so that I'll have joy. My wife needs that. My kids need that. My grandkids need that. My church needs that. Work in me. May I decide that the most important person to hear this tonight is the speaker. Help me hear it. I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. No points, just a bunch of talk. Ready? If rejoice means, and it does, full of joy. It must be important. In four chapters, 16 times, That's an average of four per chapter. He tells us. He doesn't say get the gift of rejoicing. Pray for the gift of rejoicing. He says, you know what? It's up to you. And that's what he's saying through this book. He's saying my joy is up to me. You say, well, isn't it up to God? Yeah, but God can't make, you ever met a person, Christian, that isn't joyful? God can't make them. If you were God, would you make every Christian be joyful? Hello? Uh, would, wouldn't you headlock them and noogie them into doing that? Right? You, you ought to look like a Christian. You ought to act like a Christian. You ought to walk like a Christian. You ought to sound like a Christian. I mean, if Christ is that good, shouldn't it show all the time? How marvelous. How, how, how convicting to be around someone full of cancer, ready to go to heaven, and they're smiling at you and telling you, I'm ready. Man, wow. That just blows my mind. Because I'm not there and they are. And then I'm thinking, I leave there thinking, it, it works. It works. We need to remember that we're showing this world what the Lord looks like. The Bible doesn't talk about Jesus going around laughing, smiling, telling jokes. But all the investment he made and his joy being in us. I mean, are you going to tell me what we think? Don't you think the Lord was serious? Yeah, I think he was when he died. 
I don't think he's laughing going, <laughs> but if you're Jesus Christ and you know you're going to rise from the dead in three days, won't you give a little chuckle from the cross? And everybody would say, is he nuts? You believe he's on the cross and he's chuckling? And I'll tell you what, three days later, they got it. All I'm saying, folks, it's a good thing you and I didn't write these chapters. Because the most spiritual I would be is rejoice most of the time. And then I would add, if you can or if you feel like it. I don't need a Bible like that. I need a Bible like he gave me. Philippians 4 and verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, he knows me, huh? Kind of like the Lord goes, hey, rejoice. Hey, rejoice. You understand? It's hard to rejoice. Luke chapter 2, verse 10, don't you love it? Christmas. Angel tells the shepherds, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. That, that means you and I are without excuse. That means that we can rejoice, that he's given us the reason, the answer. We are celebrating. Can you hear me? Am I loud enough? We are celebrating life, and we celebrate death. Because death is the pathway to eternal life. So are you saying, saying you like death? I hate, I don't want to die. I'm so pro-rapture and spin your head. But I do know. However I go, I know where I'm going. I don't know how I'm going. I don't know when I'm going but I know where I'm going. I don't know why I'm going other than he loves me and gave himself for me. Jesus came. Let's just, we got to fit Christmas in. You ready? Jesus came the first time. He's coming again. But he came the first time so that we have a way to rejoice always. Did he come? Did he die? Did he rise from the dead? Did he live a perfect life? Did he have victory over the devil? And you're, you're what, what are you waiting for to rejoice? I hate this question. I hate this question. What do you want for Christmas? I do. Amy, I, I hate the question. Got all I need. All the junk that I want, I buy. I don't want your junk. I want my junk. I want to be in control of the junk I buy. You're just not used to some of you being honest, are you? Dad, what do you want? Nothing. Please, nothing. I got enough junk. You guys are going to have to do something with this junk when I'm gone. And then you're going to be mad because I'm hiding stuff in the basement. And when I'm gone, you're going to go, I bought him this. Don't buy it for me. Save your money. Really. But we live in a society that it's all about what do you buy? Christmas gifts. Man, I'm sick. I, I try to get off every mailing list I can, but I'm still being bombarded with, you know, you need this. Or you need to buy this for a loved one. I'm not buying that for a loved one. And when I want it, I buy it. No, wait, wait till Christmas. Remember when your mom and dad would say that? Wait till, boy, thank God now I'm, I'm rich. I buy all the junk I want when I want. I'm going to wait till Christmas. Hello? Yeah. 
if I wrote these chapters. I would write, Rejoice in the Lord sometime. I mean, if I had to write it according to what I see, rejoice in the Lord in some things. Isn't the Christian life wacky? Isn't it crazy? I mean, really. In everything, give thanks. Because God gives everything. We may not get it, we may not like it, we may not understand it, but he goes, this is what you need. Paul's in jail. Paul's in jail. Paul, just however you want to picture it, Paul is, is, is locked up. He is barricaded. He is, he is shackled. And he keeps telling us, hey, you know what? Y'all rejoice. I mean, I expect somebody drunk to say that. But he was the one that said, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, Galatians chapter 5 says that when you have the fruit of the Spirit, not only do you have love, but you have number two, joy. Your problem is not what's happening to you or what people say to you or what people do to you. Your problem is the Holy Spirit. If he's not filling you, you are absent of joy. Whenever the Lord tells us to do something, he always gives us a plan. So he said, I, I need you to rejoice all the time. And we say, but Lord, and he goes, but nothing. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Don't, don't be selfish. Don't rob me of joy because you're in a bad mood. If you're in a bad mood, go hide. Really, get alone with God. Don't infect me with that. How you doing? Hey, how you doing? Well, I'm having a real struggle. And don't you just feel yourself go like you're melting? Hey, you feeling saved today? Not really. You're saved no matter how you feel. I didn't get saved to feel right. I got saved to get to heaven. You know, I laugh. I laugh loud. I laugh. I laugh hard. I love to laugh. We laugh. I love to laugh at Amy. I have a license to do that. For better or for worse. I don't laugh at her. I don't laugh. Uh, wow, because I, just things happen and it's just funny. We laugh at each other. We're secure. But just because I laugh doesn't mean I don't go through hard times. Doesn't mean I don't get burdened. Just because I laugh doesn't mean that there's no hope. Here's, here's, here's the neat thing. And, and I'm talking to you. I'm not saying do what I do. I'm just saying this is what Christ done for me. The, the reason that, that I, I, I can laugh and I want to laugh, it's because I know someone that can help me through hard times. Capital S. That helps. Someone. You gotta have hard times. That's what Paul said. From jail, rejoice in the Lord when you're not in jail. No, he said, always. 
and again. He begins this book, chapter 1, just look at these two things real quick. Chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, grace be unto you. You know what that, for by grace are you saved through faith. Grace be unto you. God's favor. God being good to you, you don't deserve it. If you got what you deserve, you should go to hell. You should scream and burn and go out of your mind for eternity. Listen to me, that's what we deserve. But the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Notice how Paul closes this book. He begins chapter 1 and verse 2 with grace. Notice the last verse of chapter 4, verse 23. He says, the grace. You know why I rejoice? Because of the grace of God. I was sharing the story. Some of you heard I was sharing it. And I've mentioned the name several times because I saw, don't get to see him much, and He's been about Bob House. We kind of were talking about someone we mutually knew. And I told him the story about the guy that lived downstairs when I lived with my dad before Amy and I started dating, and I was just, I, I was a mess. I mean, my, my, my buddies would drop me off at home. They'd drive me home, leave me in the car. If I didn't drive, they'd drop me out. They'd roll me on the sidewalk. They'd put me on the step. They'd never carry me to bed. you got to get better friends. I mean, they were out of there. They were... I told the story about the guy that lived downstairs who saw that, knew that. And after I got saved, I made sure I went what he saw. And I wanted him to know that I was changed. And he started crying, and I said, are, you're, are you excited? And he goes, no. He goes, I'm sad that I didn't tell you about Christ because I know the same Christ that you received. And he said, I never told you. That didn't mean a lot to me then. If I run into him, I'm going to say, hey, did you learn a lesson from that? A lot of us say, here's the lesson I should learn, but we don't always learn it. Yes, I should have joy. But do you see, what God does for us is enough for us. Grace is the word charis. Charis means cheer. The disciples are dying in a boat. They're in a storm. Jesus walks out to them. He does not say, hey, you guys ought to be praying. You ought to be calling on God. What does he say? I love it. Be of good cheer. See, no matter what happens in life, no matter what storm, even if you think you're going to die, our Lord tells us that we have someone that can bring peace to our life. Buddha can't. He's a statue. He can't heal. He can't talk. He can't see. You can chant all you want. You can hum all you want. That will not stop the storms of life. And you may not be able to stop the storm, but you'll always have someone who's there in the storm with you. Always. And if he feels like it, he'll calm your storm. Well, I think they're in a boat, they're in a storm, the waves are crashing over. He's sleeping. See, didn't I tell you our Christianity is crazy? I mean, you tell the world that, they don't get that. Why? Because they relate to the disciples, say, oh, thanks, you're here, but you don't care. You're not smarter than God. I mean, most of you aren't. Some of you might be, but most of you aren't. When we know Jesus, we have everything we need. Paul told us in chapter 4, he said, I know how to be 
low. I, need, I know how to be on the bottom base. He said, I know how to abound. I know how to be at the very top. And we get so occupied with being at the top that when the bottom comes, we fall apart. Did I share this with you? I, and I, I'm not trying to be out of bounds or anything. But it was just like, you know, I, I don't, when I was counseling Ken and Shirley, I said, you know, I don't know what you guys, Ken, you've been through it twice. Lost two wives. Shirley, you've been through, I was there, and I, I don't know what that's like, though. And Ken looked at me and he said, Pastor, we talked about this right away. And we said to each other, we know. Once we get married, we know at some point, we don't know when, but we know one of us is going to die. I said, man, that's gory. He said, yeah, but it's true, isn't it? I said, yeah, but we don't like to talk about it. But God is a God. Do you know the song? It's the God of the valley. He's the God of the mountain. If he's God on the mountaintop, he's God when you're in the valley. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. I want to abound all the time. I have this weird quirk about me. I'm in a better mood when I'm abounding. When I'm not abounding, kind of bothers me. Can I get a witness? I don't want to be the only jerk here. I need some jerkettes. Sorry, that's not a slam, that's just... I have a God. Hey, I, talk to me. I have a God that's with me. I have someone in the boat. He's sleeping, but he's there. I'm sure if I go under, he's going to wake up. Right? Look at Jesus floating on the water, sleeping. Really? And whatever God gives us comes because of his grace, his undeserved goodness. And if you and I can't find spiritual joy, then we'll have nothing to rejoice about. We'll have nothing to, to, to joy in. So we have to find the way to rejoice wherever we are in the ordinary, in the everyday, or we'll miss the opportunity to rejoice at all. You can't, I'm done. I'm not lying. I'm, I know, here, I'm done. Watch. Uh, pay attention. Here's the quiz. You can't rejoice too much. I hate it when someone's always happy, though. I, I, I don't hate them. I hate that I can't do that. Got me? Got me? Can't rejoice too much. But you can rejoice too little. Which one are you guilty of? Honestly. Paul's waiting to die. He knows he'll lose his head. They told him. They said, Paul, won't be painful, but we're, we're going to shut you up. We're going to sever your head from your body. You know what he said? It's far better. They said, what? He said, I'm going to heaven. I'll be there forever. I'll get a new head. You have this one.
You know what he does when they tell him he's going to lose his head? He rejoices. I mean, is, that's crazy. But I'm kind of getting it. I, I'm seeing it. That the only person that can keep me from rejoicing, that doesn't mean anything. Right? You know that. The only person that can keep me from rejoicing is me. Pray with me. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. Heavenly Father, I'm a Christian. You know it. I don't know that everybody knows that. I hope they do. I need to show them and tell them. I need to prove it. I don't always like the way you want me to prove it. But I know that you have everything I need. When Paul said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. But he's still rejoicing. When he was at the top of the top or the bottom of the bottom. His joy wasn't in where he was. His joy was in whose he was. And that's what I pray tonight. That we will be guilty. If we're going to be guilty of anything, that we would be guilty of rejoicing too much. That we would see no matter what, no matter where, no matter who, no matter how. We, we can rejoice. May we choose to rejoice. I don't know how you're speaking to the people in this room. I know you can. I pray you will. For their sake. Not for my, it doesn't matter what I, I get or what I feel. It matters that in their lives, they, every person here, and watching every person in this room, would get a hold of that. My joy is up to me. God's given me what I need. I got to choose it. I got to see it. I got to see where it is, who it's in. And then it's up to me. It's not up to having the right thing. It's not up to having the right job. It's not up to getting the right money. It's not up to having the right house. It isn't it didn't up to where I live. It isn't up to who I'm with. If I have Christ, if I'm in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Would you tonight cause whoever, how many ever, one, several, cause them to choose joy? At least think about it. At least desire. At least get filled with the Spirit. Allow the Spirit of God as they walk in the Spirit to give them the fruit. And, and one ingredient of that fruit is joy. We don't produce it. You do. We've got to choose to walk in the Spirit. Your head bowed. Your eyes closed. I'm going to ask you if you're saved or not. But if you're not saved, you need to get saved. If you don't know you're going to heaven, that, that's, your, that's a huge problem that only God can solve. You have to choose Him. He's already solved the problem. You just have to say, oh, I see. You have solved that problem, and you need to get saved. You need to ask him to save you. Say, Pre preacher, I'm saved. I'm saved. But preacher, your head bowed, your eyes closed. Let's just say it. Let me just get right at it. You respond to it. 
Preacher, I'm here tonight. I rejoice too little. I rejoice too little. God's speaking to my heart. Is that you? Can I see your hand? This is you saying God's speaking to my heart. Up and down, up and down. Preacher, I rejoice too little. Don't, don't start blaming. Don't start making excuses. Don't start blaming someone, something, somewhere. Preacher, I rejoice too little. I rejoice too little. Heavenly Father, revive us. You said, wilt thou not revive us again that, they, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Revive us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name. Piano's playing. You're standing. Say, I'm coming up there. Come on. Come on. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? When you're revived, the rejoicing comes from him. He doesn't give it. He makes it available. If you see what he's done, if you dwell on him, if you walk in him, if you're led of him, if you're filled with him. She's playing. God speak to you. Make the decision. Make the decision. I'm choosing joy. I'm going to leave here tonight saying, boy, I'm going to get at this. I'm going to work on this. I'm going to, I'm going to choose joy. I'm choosing joy. Choosing joy. I'm asking God to revive me so I can rejoice in him. Psalm 85, verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? When's the last time you prayed to be revived? She's going to play it through again. Might be the last time, might not. God speak to your heart, make a decision. Would you, would you for God, do it for God? I'm not talking about walking around with a smile on your face. I'm talking about something in your heart that causes you to smile. Well, I just try to smile. That's not joy. That's smiling. I'm going to pray. Father, I know, I know. Based upon what the Bible says, I know. You have given us what we need to rejoice evermore. After you straighten the Thessalonians out on the rapture, you got to chapter 5 and said, rejoice evermore. We have every reason, every reason to rejoice. The world doesn't have that. We do. They're waiting to see it in us. They're not waiting to hear our music. They're not waiting to see us dance. They're waiting to see real joy. Real joy. Joy that works. Joy that's in the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.